Welcome everybody to this South Asian Heritage Month event for our Focus on Afghanistan Day. I'm Babita Sharma, I'm a journalist, author and broadcaster and I'm delighted to uh, have with us today, I'm really excited as well to introduce Dr. Wahid Aryan, the former Afghan refugee turned doctor and humanitarian. Now over the next hour we're going to be exploring lots of different aspects of Wahid's incredible journey um, but also how it relates to modern day South Asians and the current crisis of course in Afghanistan. And we're also going to be sharing ways and tips and how you can um, understand more about some of the points that we're talking about and also help and support as well. So we will get underway. Um, Dr. Wahid, welcome. Thank you so much uh, for having me and uh, I'm very grateful for the entire team of, for uh, this conversation, which I think is very important and very current and it's, it's something that we need to address. I have just spent the last four days immersed in this, which is your book, In the Wars. Um, gosh, I don't even know where to begin, but um, for those of you that haven't read the book, I'm going to try and give you a little snapshot for those of you watching this about what um, Wahid's journey has been like, um, an incredibly inspiring one. Um, how would you describe yourself? In terms of the formal introduction, you've kindly done that. Um, in terms of um, introduction, that how would I describe myself? It's a really difficult one. I would say that I'm, I'm a proud uh, Afghan, British, and former refugee in terms of the identity now, which I had an issue with coming to, to the UK and a lot of people from r refugee and migrant backgrounds may end up having those identity issues. But on the other hand, I'm also in a way see myself as somebody who survived conflict and is now trying to advocate for people who are caught in conflict and we're talking about uh, 100 million displaced people as well, either directly as a result of conflict, persecution, uh, and for other reasons. And that's something that gives me the energy, the motivation to keep talking about my life, because I want to see people to look at the issues that are ongoing, the, uh, whether it's the problems, the challenges, and, and what we can do about these 100 million displaced people and many conflict zones through my story and it's it's not a direct representation of those many stories but i hope it's just one way to look at things how would you sum up your story i know that's a big ask because it's an incredible story um and it began uh, when you born brought up in afghanistan of course and then making the journey across to the uk um just so that people can get a sense of um your beginnings can you share with us um a little bit about your background. I think the summation of the book itself would be that the reason why I wrote it was um, generally to provide some idea or from, from my perspective that we can overcome adversity through hope. Um, and I'll talk about hope when we had no hope being born into conflict and being sort of raised uh, mm. or having spent my entire childhood in conflict and another theme that was in my mind when writing this book was how compassion heals us. It's something that uh, I know we, we talk about it a lot, but I have experienced it firsthand that compassion, whether in conflict zone in Afghanistan, whether later on as a refugee coming to the UK, how people helped me start a new life and how we can use the same compassion and solidarity to reach out to so many other people. Uh, and the third theme I would say uh, that hopefully represents the book um, is the contributions, the immense contributions of refugees and immigrants. Um, now, society is richer because of the immigrants, and we talk about this, but it's, it's important just to highlight examples as well. Again, uh, my story is just one example um, out of a billion refugees and migrants. I was very fortunate to uh, launch the first WHO World Report uh, on the health of refugees and migrants just recently. And we talk about that, that refugees and migrants should be looked as an investment. They should be looked as dreamers, as contributors. And they should be part of the society, part of the system for us to be able to serve them better and for them to be able to contribute better on the end hand as well. Yeah, I just want to take it back a bit because, you know, 
you said you've been working with the WHO on a report. Boom, that's out there. I mean, not everybody gets to do those kind of things. And you have been on an incredible journey. And um, I'll sum it up a little bit if I can. And if I get it wrong, please do let me know and, and interject. But, you know, you came to this country as a 15-year-old, is that right, to the UK? I did, yes. And you came here, and English wasn't your first language. You came with very little, pennies almost, in your pocket. You didn't know if you were going to stay. Your first introduction to this country was Feltham Juveniles Institute because of um, being at the hands of potential human traffickers, right, from Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. And then having to work out what your identity is, how you're going to stay in the UK, if you're going to stay in the UK, and what life is going to be like for you. So an unpredictable start, to say the least where many people would think, how on earth can you survive with all the cards set against you? So I'm just wondering if we can start at that point first before we talk about the incredible work that you go on, that you're doing now. Well, thank you so much. Uh, um, yes, it has always been, um, my journey has been one that uh, I have faced um, challenges and after challenges. Uh, coming to the UK as a child refugee, 15 year old was one of them. Uh, absolutely, I, I came in uh, alone on my own with no family support, um, hardly any education, with little command of English. And uh, I had $100, so not the pennies, I had okay. $100 in my pocket. Um, that's all I had. Uh, but what I brought with me was that hope, hope for safety, that I knew that there are people who are kind, they will give me safety coming from uh, Afghanistan where war was ongoing. I also brought in with me a dream, a dream that I wanted to become a doctor. I didn't know how, where to begin and how to do it. But when I came here, I started looking for that. The opportunities were here. Uh, and finally, beside all that, uh, unfortunately, I also brought in scars of conflict with me in form of uh, mental health problems such as PTSD, deep anxiety as well, and how Pursuing my dream, the compassion I received from people, and later on giving compassion back through my humanitarian work was the beginning of the healing of my own journey. But moving back to what happened actually for me before I arrived here, and I think for the audience as well, we'll just give a little bit of introduction that we can talk about the background of the 80s and the 90s war. Um, so I was born in Kabul, Afghanistan in 1983 during the Afghan Soviet conflict. And the first five years were spent hiding in cellars from the daily rockets, the bombs and the shellings. And, and actually the two happy memories that I have from those five years, one is being taken to a local park by my mother with my cousins to have an ice cream uh, and to try uh, those concrete built uh, slides uh, by the Soviets or, or the government that was backed by the Soviets. And another happy memory was me in the house and suddenly seeing my dad coming with a big kite, kneeling down, giving me the kite, and then for him to suddenly disappear. So apart from that, most of our time was actually spent trying to stay indoors because my father went into hiding from the military service. Um, anybody who had to serve on the military, that meant a death sentence, and they had to kill fellow Afghans. My father didn't want to do that, so he went into Logo province, um, hiding in, in mountains and in villages. And my mother was the main person who was looking after a big family with uh, little money that was coming in form of rent from the shops we had in front of our house, supporting us with little food, uh, with clothes that were exported by the Western world um, with mismatched colors that would keep us warm during winter. So that's kind of the five year of the childhood. And from time to time, we would go on and visit my father in Loga province, we didn't know that we were going to visit our father. My mother would keep that really secret from us so that we don't disclose that to the soldiers who were looking for my father. And we'd be sitting in a village in a room with aunties and uncles, and suddenly my dad would reappear. It would be absolutely magical. We would hug each other, and we didn't know what to make out of it because a few months ago father disappeared now father reappeared again and you were in a way not that to say anything either weren't you you were said never talk about him to anybody um, absolutely we were not because otherwise our lives would be in danger and sometimes the soldiers would come in and knock on the door because he 
he deserted the military and he he was uh, in their eyes a criminal so they wanted him and my mother would say that you know i don't know what happened to my husband he was with you he's left now just leave us alone so it's, it was incredibly difficult time and that was something that many people were living with you know, the people who families were torn apart um i touched upon that um, loss and reunion kind of that sums up the four decades of conflict affecting people's lives in afghanistan and how families are absolutely torn apart siblings are in several continents they now have the luxury of phones see, that they can talk to each other but at those times in the 80s and the 90s they would just disappear uh, to villages to mountains you would never hear from them maybe a letter that would come in uh, and that letter would be absolutely a, a treasure for the family to know that at least that person or that family member is safe so that, those were the five years and then after that like millions of refugees who went to pakistan our family decided that uh, for us to be together at least and to be safe we had to migrate to pakistan as well and that was a very dangerous journey that we took because the borders were closed and we had to go on donkeys and horses for seven days and seven nights it's extraordinary just listening to you say that because um I think we need to pause and take everything you've just said in because it's an extraordinary childhood, one that is immersed in fear and the unknown, and then also survival and resilience as well. And and you know, reading your book and talking to you now, what's what what strikes me is that anybody that has lived through a story of survival like you have, and I think about my father here, he was four at the time of partition of India and crossing over the border from what is now Pakistan to India as a four-year-old and the enormity of what he saw as well it stays with you no matter what you then go on to do whether you become you know go to the UK in 1964 as he did in his 20s and it, it stays with you and I think you know that sense of loss and reunion that you spoke about is really key here because um, I think so many people can relate to what you're saying and it's not just about Afghanistan or India or Pakistan, but it's people that have been part of sectarian violence around the world or, you know, a partition or, you know, when we look at what's happening in Ukraine today. So I'm just wondering, as difficult as that story is, what then motivated you to want to document it on paper? I absolutely agree with you. I think it's a representation of so many stories of lost reunion, of uh, going to traumas and traumas in various forms as well. Um, and the reason why I documented all that was for, in a, it was a healing journey for myself that when, later on when I came to the UK with, with PTSD, with having a life that was, in, for me, a mystery. I didn't know how to process what had happened to me. I was a child that was born into war. I didn't know what normality was like. Most of the time uh, that uh, in, in Afghanistan, whether I was in refugee camp in Pakistan, uh, I have very little contact with a world that I thought would be fair, a, a world where I could have access to education, where I could sit around and, and have a proper meal with, with family and where I could dream. So that is something that was taken away from me and I had to elements of luck, compassion, but also my own determination. So it wasn't just my own resilience. There were so many elements coming together that worked for me that, to, to arrive in the UK and then be able to later on to pursue my dream. So for me, documenting all that was a healing journey. But also, when I came to the UK as a 15-year-old child refugee, I was desperately looking for guidance. I was looking for people to tell me how I could go on to restart a new life. I was left on the street in the UK by the social services when I was 15 years old and they told me uh, who I was going to stay with. I said, I'm going to stay with a friend. I didn't know what the rules regulations were and they gave me some money and that that was it. So I wasn't sure screened me. for my mental health, for my physical health um, and, and, and also what I wanted to do in house. So I had to figure out everything myself. But going, rewinding back a little bit more to that journey where on route to Pakistan was when I actually became an adult even as, as a five or six year old along that journey. And that was when we were traveling on donkeys and horses for seven days and seven nights uh, at night time, because any activity that was seen during the day, the uh, Soviet helicopter gunship and the jets would attack and they would destroy people, weapons, anything. It was the same route that was used 
by the Mujahideen to bring in the weapons. So one morning we came out of the attack. So my father desperately ran into a village to hide me in, in an oven on the floor. And that's when we were bombarded, we were hit by rockets, exactly the same bombs on the rockets that we see now on television and kind of like brings back those memories as well. It, before the bombardment started and my father knew that their spy plane had spotted us, he told me that if anything had happened to him, that I would be responsible for the family, that I would be taking the rest of the family back to Kabul to make sure that I, um, they are safe and, and, and make sure that I look after them. And I was only five. Incredible. So in a way, that I mean, was... Uh, it's yeah, it's an incredible um, burden, I suppose, to put on your shoulders at that time. But he had no other choice. He had no choice, and I was the eldest son, and in a way that later on, I didn't um, have much of my childhood. I, you know, I couldn't think like a child. On one hand, it was a conflict. On the other hand was that I had a responsibility for the family. Uh, it was a threat to my father's life and to everybody's life on a daily basis. And that's something that you live with. Uh, it's really, it's almost impossible to describe what it feels like, that you don't know whether you'll be safe the next day or not, that whether you will have your family members safe and, and next to you or not. Uh, and sometimes it's, I wake up in the middle of the night, especially after the regime change in Afghanistan and seeing some of the really traumatic images coming from the brain. I had that hypervigilance and some of the nightmares as well. Yeah. They are the hallmark of PTSD as well. Yeah. But also, I'm not the only one. Many people who've been through conflict to that sort of deep trauma as a child uh, unfortunately, they can be re-traumatized again. And that was, yeah, it's um, triggering, isn't it? That can be incredibly triggering as well when we see those reports every day. Yeah. I mean, the theme of this event is Journeys of Empire, and you've talked about that journey you made as a five-year-old, and then, of course, the journey to the UK as a 15-year-old. When we talk about Journeys of Empire, what does that, what does that mean to you? For me... The journeys of empire, I think I would say I would more call it the journeys of human beings. I, I first saw my own journey with, with the family going to Pakistan and then displaced so many times in Afghanistan. But now I see so many other journeys of people who are caught in conflict, um, whether it's in Syria, whether it's from Ukraine, whether it's in other parts of the world as well. And sadly, I see these people as as a collateral damage. I, I see them as people who are caught in conflicts that are fought between empires. And, and that's, for me, incredibly sad that it's the, the public, it's the human who suffer. Um, and, and that's something that I wanted to convey across through my story as well of how it's through the politics, through disagreements and through trying to dominate the region or trying to secure their own future that human beings have to become, um, in a way, have to sacrifice for other people's dreams or ambitions yeah. uh, such. But on and the other hand, I've also seen actually that incredible compassion of the people. And, and that's something that I think it's important to emphasize as well. When I, with my family, when I arrived in, in Pakistan in a refugee camp, the first time round, when I just crossed the checkpoint and uh, this uh, soldier who gave me, shook my hands, back in Afghanistan, usually the soldiers were there to take us down and to hunt us. But for the first time, the soldier, he sat down and he said, welcome to Pakistan. Uh, and, and that's something incredibly touching for me as a child. Uh, and I saw that, wow, that not all soldiers are there to kill you. Not all soldiers are there to hunt you. Uh, and that was the beginning of that deep connection with uh, people from Pakistan who were very kind to us, who were very welcoming, and then millions of refugees who landed there in, in various refugee camps. We were one of them it, residing in a tent, and then later on we moved to a muddy house, where as a family of eight to ten, we were having just one fan with temperatures rising up to 45 degrees, little mm -hmm. food that was given to us in, in form of ration and uh, not much clean water. But on the other hand, they, there was kindness. They, the neighbors would give us electricity. Uh, they, they would give us a cable where we couldn't afford our own electricity, but they would just plug in that cable where we could turn on that one fan. And there was another neighbor who 
would allow me and my siblings to kind of like climb over the wall and watch the the black and white TV that they had. Uh, and that in the does garden. so much, doesn't it? Yeah. That that does so much in that moment in time to just propel you forward and to keep you going and to keep you sort of motivated, I suppose, to to carry on to the next day. I mean, I, I listening to you, I I understand what you're saying about the politics and the power struggles. Um, and I think the media have its part to play as well in terms of the labels and you know the refugee crisis, but we don't get to hear about the human story, which is why I think it's so important that people understand your story. But when you watch those news reports or you hear about another refugee crisis or a boat that's you know not made it, that's crossing Calais and, and the sensational headlines, what, what does that do to you? Well, journalists have got a very tough job to do, um, and so I have a lot of sympathy for them. And um, I'm very grateful for many journalists who have really kindly helped echo my own story, and in that sense, to give an insight, a detailed insight into conflict and displacement. If we look at these headlines, and that's something that's very worrying, uh, I'm not sure what the solution for that is. That on one hand, you know, through headlines or through news, breaking news stories, you can only cover so much, but it's really important that we talk about the humans who are caught in those boats, not the mm. boat numbers. It's it's so important that we talk about the loved ones who are left behind. It's important to talk about the dreams they're carrying in those boats. So these are not the people who um, are randomly have had everything going for them, and suddenly they decided that hey, let's just relocate to the U to the UK or somewhere else. It's not the case. It's it's the case. It, in that sense, I would like to take uh, and remind people again that you know these are people coming from conflict zones who, and, and the people have suffered tremendously. Whether they've lost family members, they've lost everything they've built, and many times, or a lot of the time, people have got all their social protective mechanisms in place. They they don't want to leave, yeah. and I've seen that firsthand with the displacement of my sister now to Sweden, where. Her husband was working for the international um, non-profit organization. They had a car, a nice house. Although the security over the past few years in Afghanistan was not good at all, um, and there was a lot of corruption and so on, but at least they were together. But suddenly she had to pack everything, and she had to leave everything, and now she's living in a flat. She has to start life from zero. Um, I saw her few, just a few weeks ago, and it was really made me sad to see that you know, the life they used to live, it was not great, but now suddenly they've relocated here because they had to, to do and that. that is, and that is the reality mm. of Afghanistan today. Um, when you look at what's happening in your home country, your country of birth, I mean, you went through so much at such a young age. And in 2022, here we are having a conversation about, about its unpredictable future. Um, can you describe to me your feelings about the situation now? In Afghanistan, the situation is extremely dire. It's it's something that really breaks my heart. Um, I think for people who have read my book, they will see that my father is one of the, the biggest optimists and he was always comes up with ways to motivate me, to motivate the family. Um, and even going through conflict that uh, in Afghanistan, I came to an age where I wanted to understand what was going on, what the meaning of life was, uh, age 10 and 12, for me, I just couldn't understand why we are under bombs all the time. Whereas on, I would tune into BBC World Service and, and listen that there are people who are going to school, they're sitting around the table, they're eating. Yeah. Uh, sometimes they would talk about dog, uh, dogs and washing their dogs. And I would be thinking, oh my God, where do they get all this water from? So it was just, incredible for me to kind of like imagine what a safe world is like with a world where people have got access to everything and what we are going through and constantly uh, not having food and constantly on the move um, to, to relocate from one place to another because of war but still my father would give us hope that uh, you know two months down the line there will be a new peace deal that's coming this new uh, government uh, will be replaced by the existing one and that continued on for months and months and months until sort of uh, we got to an age of, um, I got to the age of 15 uh, when my life was at risk and I knew that I didn't have a future for me to be able to pursue my dream of becoming a doctor. 
So then they, they send me away. But now when I speak to my father, he doesn't have that element of hope uh, left in him. Of course, he is now in his mid 70s. He's grieving because my mother passed away. And, and he's seen his entire family disintegrate once again, mm -hmm. just in front of his own eyes. Uh, three of his uh, children have now gone to, went to Sweden and to, to the US. So these are my three siblings who are newly displaced. And myself, and along with my younger brother, who I looked after in the UK, we were displaced about two decades ago. So it takes a lot of toll on him, as well as on, on entire family as well, that we see that how we're not together. Yeah. But for me, but also, it, it's also a representation of so many other families in Afghanistan who have been impacted in the same way. We're talking about a conflict that's been going on for more than four decades. And it has absolutely torn apart families, but now they're coming to a point where they can't even feed their children in Afghanistan. There are people, up to 95% of the population don't have access to adequate food. Uh, and the figures are somewhere around 50 or 55% that are the brink of starvation as well. That is a huge humanitarian crisis. And that's where it really hurts me to see that the international community has abruptly, suddenly, withdrawn all the resources away from under the feet of Afghans you know, for two decades. You know, the Western world was there. We were bombing. We were helping at the same time. Uh, but suddenly you, you remove the two elements. You yes. say, hey, militarily, we, we've got nothing to do anymore. But at the same time, you remove all the protective mechanisms that the entire system was built around. Yes, then the infrastructure you goes. People. Everything is gone now. And that's... Yeah very sad that we shouldn't uh, we should be able to differentiate between the political front and the humanitarian front we we, we shouldn't stop the aid we shouldn't stop or uh, freeze the money and aspects that can actually help the society do you know i'm just sitting here thinking about your father experiencing as much as he's experienced and i'm sorry mm. for the loss of your of your mother um and, and the breakup of the family as well. But to be at, at his age in his sort of mid to late 70s, he said, and seeing what he's seen and to see almost history repeating itself that perhaps lessons haven't been learnt in Afghanistan. I mean, what, what words of hope can you give us today about, you know, where there may be an opportunity for things to be turned around for people like your father or families in Afghanistan today? As a humanitarian, I always have hope, and that's something that drives me forward. How do you get that hope, by the way? That's what I wanted to ask you. Where does that hope come from? What, where does, how does that propel you? Because with, with everything yes. you've been through and all the hardship, I suppose you you need yeah. to have that hope. But where does that sense come from? Does, yeah. Is that faith? Is that upbringing? It's, it is. It's, it's the accumulation of experiences on one hand, and then on the other hand, it's it's seeing that how lives can be transformed by reaching out to each other. Uh, and, and that's something that, you know, we talk about my resilience, but in a way that during conflict, we would go from one house to another and they would just welcome us. They would share the bread with us. Uh, and in Pakistan, the people would help us tremendously. Uh, the neighbors I talked about, and later on in India, when I took my mother in year 2020, um, because she had, to, tummy problem and that's where we got the diagnosis that she had terminal cancer and how kind the people were to us there as well the medical colleagues and, and so i see that kindness everywhere around the globe and that's something that's a source of hope for me as well on the other hand for me that to see people uh, how they suffer and it, it's millions of people and how we can actually come together and help those people one example is Sometimes when I'm very, very challenged and completely sort of uh, disappointed in if things are not going the right way, I think about a child who I met in a refugee camp, I think it was in 2015 in Kabul. Uh, she was internally displaced. I was sitting with her and talking to her. Uh, my brother was taking uh, some pictures around and some videos. And I was looking into her eyes and she was telling me some stories. And suddenly I immersed straight into a story reliving my own childhood in a refugee camp exactly the way she was and later on i snapped out of it and i realized oh my god you know look at me now uh, i i made it out safely uh, and i have uh, achieved my dream 
of becoming a doctor to reach out to people. And now she is just like me. You know, what's the difference? You know, if she has the same opportunities like yeah. I did, uh, and I'm sure she, she would do incredible things in the world as well. So that's something that, uh, that's, and that's one charm. We've got millions of displaced people, millions of people who are impacted, and whether it's migrants or the refugees. So that's something for me that I have hope in humanity. And that's something that uh, it's, it's extremely important. It's one of the protective mechanisms, my own mental health as well, dealing with trauma after trauma. I'm glad you mentioned mental health there because um, I've just, um, just before chatting to you, just finished another event where we're talking about the legacy of partition of India. And, and one of the key things that came up was about ensuring that we have open lines of communication, which is often difficult for the community to speak so vulnerably about trauma but understanding that um, to move forward we have to really make sure that we are grounded and in check with our mental health all the time and i think with families and individuals and refugees and former refugees and people all the time and just everyday life if we don't have that in check kind of that to-do list with our mental health then it can really impact us the experiences that we've been through on these journeys of empire and um i'm wondering you know if you would agree with that and also how you're able to stay grounded if you are or how you're able to exercise your mental well-being i fully agree with you um so when i came as a 15 year old here that although i brought with me that hope and that gave birth to that my determination to keep working doing three jobs during the day, cleaning, working as a shopkeeper assistant, and um, also as a kitchen porter. At night time, I was studying at three different colleges. I was so desperate to use the opportunities because I thought that at any moment, those opportunities could be taken away from me. I was still waiting for my decision from the home office. And I was, I was only living under the um, temporary residence permit. So, those kind of were the times that on one hand I was running so high on adrenaline, but deep down I, I had the trauma with me. In a way I thought, that, oh, I could just tie up everything, lock it away, yeah. uh, and, and let's start as Wahid 2.0, a new life. So that was my thinking, not understanding what trauma works and how PTSD works as well. But later on, uh, all those memories came back and haunted me, you know, during even those times of me studying and working in London, uh, the PTC was cropping from time to time. Uh, if I was looking at a bus, red bus, I would suddenly see that a tank was reappearing. Um, if I had to have nightmares and suddenly, a nightmare that a sniper was taking my head down and kind of like was killing me. I had to go and open the window to see that I was in London actually. But all that, sort of didn't stop me, but it may well stop other people from realizing their dream, from reliving or from, from starting a new life. And that's so important to address that. Yeah. And I was fortunate that yeah, for the hope that was instilled in me for, for such a long time, the drive that I had and the opportunities at the same time that I had as well, that I managed to get to Cambridge University and study at, at Harvard and Imperial to make something out of my life but i do believe that other people coming in whether as refugees or, or migrants they, they have equal uh maybe in a, in a different way uh, their own dreams their own hopes but sometimes they can't realize that on one hand it could be the social factors but on the other hand it could be the mental health for them yeah. that they may be suffering uh, immensely so that's why it's it's really key for us to to make sure that we have mental health services available that are culturally sensitive, uh, culturally responsive, and they are comprehensive, um, and they are, are done led by experts, which is something that I'm working on now for and under the Aryan Wellbeing, uh, a venture through which we're bringing all the mental health experts together, trying to provide the mental health support online, um, and that's the problem that I've seen in the UK, and the problem is far bigger in in many other you know, corners of the world with, with low resource uh, with low resources whether it's the mental health or the physical health or yeah in, in it, other ways. it absolutely is and i'm you know i'm very honored to be a trustee on a global mental health foundation um united for global mental health and and 
through those through that lens i'm able to really understand mm -hmm. um the impact of everything we're talking about you know of that trauma of that displacement of that lack of identity the sense of belonging what that does to a person and how important it is that we can all do mm -hmm. our bit to help that um you mentioned cambridge and harvard i mean we don't have time to sort of expand on every facet of your incredible life so far but um you know you you summarized it for us and becoming a refugee at such a young age turning things around you live you always had that dream close to your heart of being a doctor you went to cambridge you didn't just go to a university you went to cambridge and harvard and you succeeded in fulfilling that dream and that ambition and getting married and having a family and settling here and you mentioned at the very start of this conversation about the who and now i'm going to go there actually because you know the achievements that you've received on a personal level are you know very very inspiring but it doesn't stop there with you does it Wahid? you decided that you wanted to do more and give back more to the community to afghanistan um before i let you go i know we don't have a lot of time but if you could just share with us some of the things that you're working on at the moment and you mentioned the who report i know that's one of many things that you're doing well thank you so much uh very kindly touching upon achievements um well my mother i think my late mother um she summarized my achievement getting into cambridge university when i called and i couldn't wait to tell her that i got into cambridge university and i said oh that's all good what are you coming home so that was it so i, I can sympathize uh, so, with that i remember when i um when i did a, a television doc and it was like this you know big series on bbc2 mom said oh, when are you getting married <laughs> was the key was the key thing so yeah i i totally get that i totally get that so, so that's kind of the reception that i had there and, but mums always have faith in their children and so I'm, i was very fortunate despite having them not being to school and trying to save us and, and during conflict the one thing that they gave me was they, they just inspired me uh, looking at their own resilience but also they just told me that son um, education is the way forward where no matter where you are, whether it's refugee camp in Afghanistan or anywhere else, you're trying to do something with your life. And that's that's all I had from them. And that was a green light. But for me, coming here to the UK, of course, I wanted to become a doctor. And there was something more attached to that. That was for me to be able to support my family, to have a future for myself, to secure my own future. But deep down, there was something else. Because in that refugee camp in Pakistan was when I became inspired to become a doctor because I had tuberculosis. I was treated by another doctor uh, back there and I became friends with him. He gave me a stethoscope and a black and white textbook and uh, he knew that because of my curiosity and all that, that uh, I may become a doctor and he said, son, um, I know that uh, you will become a doctor, so you will need these. Wow. Um, so that's something that, but, but for me, I think it was more, more than that. It was for me seeing children suffer, children die, even I couldn't process that, but now reflecting on that journey, knowing that children would die from simple illnesses, they would die from malaria, from tuberculosis, from all these other problems that can be stopped, is something that I can make sense of now, that why were I so driven um, to, to, to do that? So for me, it's always been beyond my own achievement. Um, and, and it's something that I realized it was in 2017 um, that, 2014 was when I was uh, on a training uh, to become a radiologist and it, it leading to consultant position, which is very well paid. And uh, I was married uh, and, and, and having an amazing family, um, our first child. And, and something that I wasn't having, I didn't have that contentment. I didn't have, I knew that there was something deeper missing. I couldn't just figure out what it was. On the site, I had founded Aaron Tangier Charity, which connects medics from the NHS and across the world to Afghanistan first, and we scaled it to Syria. And now we are operative in parts of Africa and in different corners of the world. Uh, and that is saving life. So I was working in the NHS uh, full time, but also having a bit of charity on the site. But I knew that it wouldn't work out for me. I really had to go all in. Mm -hmm. um, on my own, of course, it, it's an incredible honor for me to be serving on the, in the NHS. But deep down, I knew I could give more of me. I, and I, that's how I thought that, you know what, I need to share my story with, with the world. I need to use elements of my story to bring in people together 
who have got their own stories and, and to inspire each other. And in the process, to, through that collective compassion, we can touch people's lives. So everything else that's come out of it, whether it's the awards or being recognized by the UN or uh, the prime minister here and so on, that is all collective achievement. But for me, it's more than that. It's for me, it's reaching out to people. How many lives um, we touch, I think is not the, the, the important point. And how we touch those lives, whether it's a single life, which is our neighbor's life, whether it's somebody on the street in our own community, or whether the way we do it internationally, globally as well, uh, I think at the end of it, it's it's something for me when I'm reflecting and, and I see that I've managed to bring like-minded people around a vision, whether it's the humanitarian, now we're working on mental health or other projects uh, moving on, or whether going to um, talk at the launch of the world's um, first report on, on the health of refugees and migrants representing one billion people there. Incredibly, that's that's humbling for me personally but it's using every opportunity as a platform to reduce that inequality. I'm so glad that you have done that because um, that little voice on your shoulder saying, um, I think you need to do a little bit more. I can sympathize with that, by the way, because the same thing happened to me um, last year when you know, you're doing a certain thing and you're on a career trajectory and there's this little voice saying, ah, you need to do something else or do, do, do what feels right. It's a gut instinct, isn't it? But Thank you yeah. for sharing your incredible story with us and, and for the incredible work that you do. Um, before I let you go, I, I, I'd love to find out um, in terms of the future hopes for Afghanistan and if you've been back and are you going back and, and what your feelings are towards the country now? I would love to go back. Uh, it's a discussion I had with uh, WHO colleagues as well, how we can support Afghanistan. But I would say that individually we can support Afghanistan. Um, anybody can donate to one of the humanitarian organizations who's operating. Of course, our charity is one of them, but there are so many others who are. Um, our charities are in but there are amazing charities for providing food, medicine, shelter. Uh, so I think we need to, people can get in touch individually. Um, as a, there's a big responsibility on the state here that international community needs to sit around the table and to not ignore Afghanistan because you know our interests are not there any longer politically. And that doesn't mean that because we have actually interfered in Afghanistan for such a long time, it's not something that we have to do them a favor. You know, it's the, the, what we see now is a consequence of the interference for four decades. I think it's time the international community sits around the table and to formulate a path, uh, a humanitarian path of how to support the people whilst allowing an intra-Afghan dialogue, which is the only way, uh, the only solution for Afghanistan. It's not through bombs, it's not through military inter interference. Um, I think it's, it's all been just completely wrong, just going the way we did. Um, the Western world has gone in, in for the past two decades or even longer um, through the Soviet invasion and so on, allowing Afghans to sit. But everybody can help individuals, communities, international organizations and the states. And I hope people help because people are starving. People are absolutely living through extremely difficult conditions now that even they have to sell their children. They're selling their kidneys. And this is something that you know, in, in, this, in this day and age, we shouldn't be listening and we shouldn't be hearing and, and then sitting, not doing anything. And of course, we've heard about the lack of access for girls and young women to education in Afghanistan today as well, which is um, incredibly worrying. Um, I'm reminded listening to you, Wahid, of um, an eminent climate scientist who I interviewed short, just I think about a month and a half ago, uh, Professor Salim al Haq, who said um, with regards to the climate crisis in Bangladesh, we don't want your sympathy or charity, we want your solidarity in action. And I thought those words were incredibly powerful and, and I feel that sense with you as well it's like yes charity and sympathy there is a time for that but actually it's about solidarity it's about action it's about community action coming together and helping people not only in afghanistan but in other countries like ukraine um where clearly there's going to be a lot of work needed but um would you agree with that that it's actually not about just saying oh you know never mind but it's it's action that's needed now Absolutely, I fully agree with that. And I think if we see the world now, it's um, humanity has been on the move uh, since mm. we've known it. 
uh, conflict has always been there. Now we see it in Afghanistan, we see it in Syria, in other parts of the world. And we should be alarmed that we've seen it so close to home here in Ukraine, you know, a few hours away from us. And uh, God forbid it could be us one day here in the UK, it could be the US. So we, we shouldn't take that safety for granted. That's why that solidarity is so important to understand that the conflicts will always be part of our life, that displacement will be, will be part of our life. Uh, it's only through that collective compassion. And look, doing that compassion, not from, from a lens uh, that we have to help because they're close to us, they're of the same color to us, but we do it because they are human beings, uh, regardless of their race, their gender, or their location, even if they are hundreds uh, uh, of, of, of tens of thousands of miles away. And that's really important because we see that discrimination here and we shouldn't allow um, sort of our, our uh, humanity to be clouded but those biases. So the antidote for all that is that collective compassion, that solidarity. Then we look at uh, ourselves living in one big world, the same way as we did with COVID. The only way we managed to defeat COVID was for all the international community coming together and tackling it as, as one big community. So when it comes to conflict, when it comes to environmental disasters or other disasters that we're going through, we can't do it in solo. Because it will come and it will burn us, uh, whether sooner or later, it could be one year, two years, or, or 10, 20 years down the line. And people will remember how we actually reached out to each other at that point. Yeah, absolutely. And how we can learn from the lessons of the past mm. as well. Mm. Um, Dr. Wahid Aaron, it's been a pleasure speaking to you. Thank you so much for today's event. Um, it's truly an honor. And for those of you that haven't had a chance to read it, In the Wars, I was just gripped by this. I need you to sign it there, okay, at some point. <laughs> but it was an incredibly well. exciting read um, and an inspiring read. Um, and as Khaled Hassini, the uh, author said, a dazzling testimony to the extraordinary, extraordinary contribution that refugees make. I couldn't have said that better myself. Um, just a reminder to those of you that are joining us, um, if you'd like to keep up to date with um, any of the events taking place on the South Asian Heritage Month, then you can do so on the link that we're going to provide as well. And also, he mentioned um, the organizations and the charities that he's involved in. Um, Wahid, if it's, if it's okay with you, we're going to put up a link so that people can follow that and find out a bit more information about that as well. But on behalf of everybody uh, joining us today and listening, we'd like to thank you, Dr. Wahid Aaron, for being such an incredible guest. Thank you so much for making this event a truly inspiring one. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Babita, for having me. It's such an honor to be speaking with you and to be able to contribute uh, to, to everything else that you're doing. Thank you.